He worked in the front office of the uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, formerly Fish and Game, for about 14 and a half years, including five years as director. He was a lead administrative person under Governor Duke Machen, uh, drafting the State Endangered Species Act, the state's Oil Spill Response Act, addressing the selenium issue in the San Joaquin Valley, and as lead for the Department of Delta Water Issues, even before CalFed became formalized. He's done work with uh, salmon, uh, with the National Wetland Council, and uh, various other things that you can read about in uh, the program. So uh, he's an expert in, expert in CEQA and NEPA, if you know what those are, as well as the Endangered Species Act. Another UC Davis graduate, uh, please welcome Pete Carmadelli. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. First, I want to thank everyone who's laid the groundwork with the presentations we've heard this morning. I don't have to talk about the variability of climate, the big one, or the lack of water. Those have all been made clear. I don't really have to talk about conjunctive use of water, the interface between groundwater and surface water. That's been covered very effectively. I just get the very simple task of trying to put in perspective sort of how the water system in California works and the policies that govern it, and touch briefly on those points that were shown in the later years where all those red points moved that 100% delivery of water well below, called the environmental issues and concerns that sort of trigger out and come into play. I could have set up a nice presentation, but I was having trouble figuring out which slides made sense, so I decided to go without them and rely on all of your expert knowledge on the layout of the state of California. Water comes from the north and is used everywhere. The short, simple version of how things work in California. We are now the, one of the most plumbed areas in the United States. If you stop and think for a moment that just with the federal and state projects and their interrelated delivery units um, in northern and southern California, that water from the Trinity a tributary to the Klamath, which hits the ocean just south of the Oregon border, that water is deliverable to San Diego. That puts in perspective what we have done to move a resource from one place to the other in the state. Each of those interactions are tied to the water that is available from the Colorado district that's plumbed in and the entire east side of the Sierras which is plumbed in for urban delivery in the south. Urban delivery, like farm delivery, dates back a ways. All we need to think about is Hetch Hetchy, which is Diane Feinstein said when she was mayor of San Francisco, we stole fair to square. That's water that's collected and delivered to the city of San Francisco from Tuolumne. East Bay has basically taken the Calaveras. So urban districts have always reached to the Sierras to bring their water in. The one thing that most water deliveries in California have in common is they all funnel through two main water systems, the Sacramento and the San Joaquin into the Delta. We have isolated pockets, the North Coast rivers which go out, and as I noted, even those are partially plumbed over. We have some east side deliveries that aren't there we have some smaller water pockets along the coast but by and large california is interrelated and interlocked when it comes to water delivery traditional water management in california is a composite of multiple layers of water rights law we have riparian use generally for people who border the rivers who immediately use water we have appropriative rights where if you were using the water from a stream and delivered it, you have that right, it's locked in. Pre-1914 and the riparian are basically way predate the formal state structure, which occurred later and is under the water rights or appropriative rights that are all put in place and have been granted by the state. 
We have other overlaying statutes that come into play that have traditionally set where we go. Something called the Swamp and Bale Laws, which basically help create essentially what we have in the Delta today. It also applies to many other areas of the state where essentially if you came in, built a levee, bailed it out, the land became yours, you can burn it to ag. That's how the Delta, as we know it today, essentially came into being. We have a situation where we have continual demand from farm versus urban. Our urban growth in California did not essentially start except for a few Bay Area locations until after the, world, the Second World War when it really began to blossom and bloom. Although LA reached up in the early teens and grabbed the Owens Valley, basically took its groundwater and moved it to LA. San Francisco reached across and took, and East Bay reached across and took from the Sierras. So the urban needs and the need to deliver water to where the people were for urban uses was always there. Ag use predominantly is because agriculture grew where the water was. Therefore, because they were there, they have the older rights, the more in time rights. Very logical, makes perfect sense when you look at the history of where we are and how we got to where we are today. Much of the early work was done through local development. Merced Irrigation District, you've heard some about that. Turlock, Modesto Irrigation Districts, Oakdale, they all provided very good substantial projects, helped deliver water for agricultural uses. I think someone said that the mission started the delivery of water. I was just over in the Owens Valley last, as a matter of fact, uh, yesterday, and um, looked at a development that was done, put in by the Indians, from way, the Paiute Indians in that area where they diverted some of the small streams coming off of the Sierras channel for growth, put in annually, the canals are still there. So the concept of moving water to where you had to do it to get the beneficial uses is not new. And it's had something we have to have always had to do here in California. <coughs> in addition to our local projects, we've had two major state projects, or larger projects, state and federal. These two big systems have finally, after multiple years in the late 70s and early 80s, began to integrate the use of their water. The federal government basically came in and began to implement a state water plan when the state could not afford it in the 30s. And that's how we picked up the big state, first big state reservoirs, Shasta, Millerton, Fresno, or uh, Folsom, New Maloney's, all were part of the federal system. That was largely an implementation of a broader state plan which had been devised but was unable to be implemented because of the depression. The federal government, using Public Works Act funds and concepts and approaches, began that implementation. The only major state player in this is Orville Dam, which caps the feather. And they all come back into the Delta and integrate. A couple of things that we need to remember as we look at this, Bryant essentially takes the San Joaquin's flow and moves it south to provide for Tulare County and parts of Kern and western, eastern Fresno County with their water. <coughs> that meant the San Joaquin River no longer flowed north. It is essentially diverted south for much of the year. When the, that was done by the federal government. That impacted the water rights holders already on the river. For those water rights holders to give up their water, they had to be provided with an alternative water source. So when Shasta comes in and the water is delivered by way of the pump south, the first call on that federal water goes to the traditional old holders of water rights who get it delivered under contract because their water that they used to get from the San Joaquin now goes south to somebody else. Therefore, Westlands, which is not an old water right holder, sits right next door to people who will get twice as much water delivered, even in this year, as they will get delivered, because that's make-up water that they don't get out of the San Joaquin because it goes south. Have I confused everyone now sitting at this point? The main point that I'm trying to make is we have a massively integrated and complex system of water rights, water laws, 
water delivery systems throughout California. And you'll notice I just briefly touched on the urban development, a couple of the ag local developments, and that sort of thing. I'll get back to a little more of that later. Overlaid on this standard complex water system, in the early 70s, we overlaid environmental laws. And those started out very differently than they are today. For example, when Governor Reagan signed the CEQA document, it was meant to apply to <coughs> governmental public works projects. The courts basically have broadened that governmental decision making to anything that a governmental decision is implied with requires CEQA to be covering it if it's going to have an impact. So we went from what were going to be just public works to everything else with our friends in the court providing supplemental interpretation. Something that you're not going to find in common with any of the statutes that I'm going to briefly touch on. You've already heard from several people about the Clean Water Act issues and how they came into play. What that means and how we have to keep flows out there and how even sediment has become a major issue in terms of water quality. You've heard brief mentions of the Endangered Species Act federally, which also came down under uh, President Nixon, along with the EPA. And then we fast forward and California has overlaid its own structures on top of that. I was involved uh, after I got to Fish and Game in the State's Endangered Species Act as its own came into play. And I can tell you every error I made in the drafting of that statute I had to live with them. We had no provision for take, and I had to use scientific take permits in order to work that through for the first 15 years or so of the project until the courts threw that out. The legislature finally made the first and only significant change to that act. By the way, we are still waiting for the first substantive change to this Federal Endangered Species Act. You're all used to now working under biological opinions and habitat conservation planning and all of those great things, those were largely interpretations that have been provided to the act backed up by court, interpret court rulings. Not something that has ever been done with a statutory change. I want to point out one more thing. Governmental agencies operate on statutes implemented by regulations. Their flexibility is always limited by those two overriding areas. The Endangered Species Act is rigid, single nature. It's not one that leads to a lot of interpretation. And unless that is changed, you're going to continually have the conflicts that persist in terms of the acts. Let's go back quickly for a moment to the um, couple other factors that come out of water rights that need to be understood as we overlay this. You've already heard some reference to beneficial use and reasonable use doctrines and to the public trust doctrine. In short, those basically mean the following. The beneficial or reasonable use doctrine basically says you cannot waste water and all of its beneficial uses must be considered when you get a water right from the state of California. The public trust doctrine was overlaid coming back as late, it was not until the 80s when it was basically expanded and applied first to Rush Creek in Mono Lake where they basically said you have a public trust below a dam that LA Water and Power had put in and there are fish below that and those fish have to be kept alive because that is a public trust used by the people of the state, held by the people of the state for their use and enjoyment. Therefore, that public trust must be protected, and all of a sudden, the traditional ability to take the water behind that dam and move it south had to be tempered to put some flowing down the stream for fish, which resulted in water in Mona Lake and raising the elevation. The public trust doctrine was subsequently applied to the Delta in the Racinelli decision, which is one you need to keep in mind. This doctrine and this application is what has everybody worried and is creating the climate we're in today. In short, the Racinelli's decision said the public trust doctrine applies to the Delta. And it is not just the two big late players 
who have an obligation under that public trust, meaning the state and federal systems, it is also all other players whose water otherwise would flow unimpeded to the Delta. And all of a sudden, every user is in the game. San Francisco, East Bay Mud, all of the ag districts are all in the game if the public trust doctrine for what's needed for Delta applies to everyone who takes water that would otherwise flow. That's important because the Delta visioning work under Phil Eisenberg's group brings that back heavily into the current program we are looking at in terms of the state's dual policy that's now in place with the co-equal goals of a stable water supply and restoration of the Delta. If everyone is responsible for the overall system in the Delta, everyone is responsible to put in a portion of the solution to the Delta. That means everyone who's had a traditional water right and thinks we know what it means and thinks we have it stabilized is potentially subject under the application of beneficial and reasonable use combined with public trust doctrine to provide some of their water to help pay the solution price. Not just the latecomers in the game, the state and federal projects who are the bigger, later impactors. So all of a sudden, everyone has a stake in what's happening in the Delta. The concept of restoration in the Delta is a real interesting question. What are we restoring to? Are we restoring to swamp and bale? As we most of us think about it, what is there today? Where we have the Delta Islands with the ag that goes through and its subsidence and has now dropped many of them 20 and 30 feet below the river levels? Are we restoring to maintain that which we have built our infrastructure around with all of our highways and water delivery systems and utility lines that run through it? Is that our restoration point? Are we looking back a little bit and restoring to that? Let's talk about it for a simple moment from a fishery standpoint. The Delta had native fisheries that survived with a large, basically, swamp that had a tidal influence way out and way up. After all, the Ice Street Bridge here in Sacramento is tidally influenced. So we have that tidal movement. We grew up and the Delta became something that lived from that traditional Mediterranean cycle of boom and bust in water, huge floods, heavy droughts every year and variably between years. So we basically had the native fisheries, smelt for example, who grew up in that climate. Then we did a couple little other minor overlays on the Delta besides the fact that when we began storing water and changing it, we no longer have that complete boom bust cycle. We no longer have the Delta tides working. We put in islands. Now we're channelizing. All of the area where they retreated to, to grow, isn't there anymore. They're pushed to the margins for their sources of the climate, you know, the up and downs, the growth areas they need. Salmon came through peak times. Went all the way up. Salmon went up to the short hedge, uh, most of the way up Mount Shasta, or Lassen rather, for example. We have salmon that far up, way up the Pitt River system. All of those are gone. And we're wondering why we have some problems. And then we overlaid a little thing called ballast water. And ballast water introduced other foreign species. We no longer have the underpinnings of the system that we once had. The largest clam, volumetrically of clams, for example, that keep filtering and cleaning the water in San Francisco are from the Asia. The native ones are essentially gone. We go all the way down to the zooplankton and bioplankton level, and we have changed the makeup with introduced species. Then we've added little things like mercury, which was used heavily in our mining, and we're still paying a heavy price for in terms of mercury contamination. We have the fact that everyone pulls in water, uses it, 
flushes our toilets, pump it out, goes to a nice sewage treatment plant, and that gets flushed into the water where it gets diluted a little further down and gets reused again and again and again and again. That's impacted. So we have no simple factors. Oh, and fisheries management for my old agency is part of the problem too. After all, we introduced striped bass into the system for fisheries purposes. And striped bass just love baby salmon. So we have a complex system with no one answer. We overlay on it a large state and federal pumping system, which effectively, in the summer months, reverses the flow of the outfall from the delta, pulls it back to those pumps so it can be shipped south. Needless to say, that's created a few issues from an environmental standpoint. But we don't know what we're actually targeting to, targeting for, or what we're restoring to. We know just that we are going to restore the delta to a degree, keeping in mind under the state policy the current agricultural operations and everything else in the delta. So we aren't really sure where we are, but we're moving towards it as a matter of state policy. State policy also says we want supplies of water stabilized and known. We have heavy demand to the south. We have, relatively speaking, late coming agriculture in places like Westlands, whose water really came from the federal pro projects delivering water to them to allow them to develop. They have a clear need. Kern County, much of Kern County fits into that category. We have heavy demands in that area. So what we have are all these massive number of competing needs overlocking, interlaying, and coming together. So the state said we have two competing needs vis-a-vis -vis the Delta. But they weren't done. We then wind up with a couple of other things. Remember I talked about the fact that with Bryant Dam, we now took the San Joaquin south. We had long stretches of that, the San Joaquin that literally went dry. Now we have overlaid on that a San Joaquin restoration program, which has finally come down. That restoration program says we're going to restore salmon to the San Joaquin. We are going to tell you what flood channels are there, what channel we're going to restore it in, but we're going to restore it as we move it in. That means water from Frying is going to be, have to be re-released into the San Joaquin. That means there's less to go south to the people who had it. It's coincidental that temperance is on the table for discussion in that area. Because temperance would be above Millerton and would provide a stable water source for that area to offset the restoration needs. Because remember, when any all of the dams were put in, none of the environmental overlays were present. But the water for those environmental needs through beneficial use and public trust are now required to be taken out of that same water supply. So that's the conflict. So temperance comes in. And temperance, by the way, is largely a locally sponsored program because they know what their local needs are. They're not relying on the state or federal government who are virtually incapacitated to getting anything done especially with the overlay of competing interests that are daily in the legislature and the halls of Congress. They are largely locally sponsored because, frankly, no one trusts the state or federal government to ever build a large project again. Sites up in the north has been proposed, again, largely <coughs> sponsored by local people. GCID, for example, is the lead in pulling that together. Why do they have an interest? They've got one of the oldest water rights on the Sacramento River, both from a standpoint of repairing use and appropriation. Most of it's pre-1914. But because it's pre-1914, it has never been formally quantified or adjudicated. Their water delivery is secured only because of a contract, largely, from the federal government. Because when Shasta went in, the federal government flowed that water right on by them, and they needed to know how much GCID was going to take. So they, through a series of contracts, locked in what GCID was going to take under their old 
riparian and pre-1914 rights with a delivery of a set amount of water. I'm only using them as an example. That same thing applies to virtually every one of the major northern valley water districts where their supply is largely stabilized from surface water by the contracts with the state or federal projects, many of which are old and have never been fully adjudicated to know the exact volume or amount. Then let's look at one other minor complicating factor, just in case we haven't given you enough yet. We decided that early on, hydropower was an important aspect of what we do. And I'm gonna to go to one river system, the Pitt River system. Pitt is essentially above Shasta. It's water, there's no longer a salmon run, Shasta effectively cut that off, so that's not an issue yet. I'll get to why that may be later in a moment. <laughs> and on that system, you have a whole series of hydroelectric dams, each of which has a water right to store water, use it to generate electricity, moves it on. They haven't really appropriated much of it to use. Most of it's just temporary storage to generate power. But when you look at a system that says you've got X number of water rights on the Sacramento watershed, each of those projects shows up as a water right, which it is for purposes of storage and generation of power. And that's not necessarily controlled by the state for the simple reason that those are power projects controlled by FERC, Federal Energy Relicensing and Group back in DC and our friends back there. And you see, they are not subject to state water rights. And they overlay and beat out state water rights according to a wide variety of court cases. So we have electric use of water. And that's common throughout all of the areas. And virtually every dam has a hydro influence, a hydroelectric influence in it, and a different set of governing laws, rules, and how it fits within the system. All I'm doing is giving you a very quick once over trying to lay out the complexity of the system. There are massive nuances and tons of laws and ton, even more court cases complicating each of these. We then heard about the flood issues. California did do the great planning, created our causeways and bypasses and everything was working fine until we get the big one as we've already heard. And again, you heard a reference from Mike about the fact that they, meaning the operators of the system, do not control many of the dams. Because the majority of the dams, particularly the San Joaquin, are not state or federal project dams. They are local district dams with totally different operating regimes and without coordinated operating agreements. We finally have one between the state and the feds. They started in the 50s building, 40s and 50s building, but they didn't integrate their operations till the late 70s, early 80s. And even then, it's not perfectly integrated. And when it comes to flood control, we have another player, the Corps of Engineers. And the Corps of Engineers built some dams in California strictly for flood control. Oh, coincidentally, the water from them is marketed, but by the Bureau of Reclamation, not the Corps. So nothing is simple is what I'm trying to get across to you when we deal with the issues. In um, the early 90, late 90s, CalFed came into play and CalFed eventually said, we're going to look at this as a whole system dealing with the Delta. And we're going to look at all of the proposed dams and all the proposed projects that are out there because we're probably going to need to raise some more storage at some point. When they got done with their priorities, three potential dams were left on the table. Two locally controlled ones I've already mentioned, Temperance and Sites, and one federal project, the raising of Shasta. And there are no issues with the raising of Shasta other than redoing the entire infrastructure of Northern California and inundating significant Native American habitats, which have a few other complexities that overlay on it, as well as um, securing the water rights to do so and what that means and how that impacts everybody below it, below them. 
So other than that, there are no issues there. And again, that's the decision being made back in DC, right? And by DC controlled bureaucrats, not in California. So other than that, there's no issues with that dam, but that is the biggest single potential dam left on the table that's even discussed. What happened to Auburn, for example? It's off the table, and many people thought it was dead. But all of a sudden, we have a couple other things happening. Remember that Delta visioning thing we talked about, the BDCP, all the stuff to restore the Delta? Out of that has come, oh, we have the Racinelli decision. And finally, in the plan just released, they asked us to, well, maybe we want to look at many of the projects that have been removed from the table with CalFed and putting them back on the table. I think they were thinking more of the smaller version of the projects, more localized projects, and local sponsored projects that can be integrated into the overall operations to help boost water supply availability. My question, why not put Auburn back on the table? It fits the same patterns. As a director of fishing game when I was in the uh, Duke Machen administration, it was still the official policy of this Department of Fish and Game, you notice I'm not saying fish and wildlife, fish and game, <laughs> that the Auburn Dam should be built because it would provide water to the Delta quickly and effectively to provide cool water for the salmon coming up the American River and provide quick delivery of water when needed in the Delta to meet the other requirements, such as salinity standards. What's a salinity standard? We basically have a requirement in order that the water quality for the pumps be correct, that we maintain a certain standard of salinity by putting additional fresh water flows largely from storage through the delta to keep the salinity levels low enough so that the water we send south through the state and federal projects is drinkable. And that means we put enough outflow to meet the salinity standards. What has that done? That means we now have year-round flows, not widely fluctuating flows in the Delta, that are nicely fresh, not saline. And we have a wonderful largemouth and smallmouth bass fishery in the Delta. It's now the best in the state. I don't recall, in my old looking at fisheries, any largemouth or smallmouth bass being in the Delta native fisheries-wise. They were not there as the major player. So we now overlay a climate where we've essentially created a controlled inland lake with all different fish species. So we've added all of these things together, and guess what? The natives, the salmon, the salmonids, and the smelt didn't do very well with everything that's happened. Is any one issue the answer? No. Will we ever be able to get them back to where they were? Probably not. Is that where we need to be? Different question. If I'm looking at it from an endangered species standpoint, it's where I must be because I've got to preserve them and protect them. And I'm preserving and protecting them when they get on the margin of being ready to go under. Not before. I made a decision when I was the director that I said we cannot list the winter run salmon because there is no genetic difference between that and any other run of salmon in the Sacramento system. The courts told me I was wrong. The court said the winter run is a distinctive subspecies, has to be separately addressed and listed, along with discussions of the spring run, the fall, the early fall, the late fall, and the winter. So we have four runs of Chinook salmon. Then we have the coho salmon, they're impacted. Then we have the steelhead, they're impacted. We cut off a lot of their habitat. We changed the flow patterns. And there's a little question about fishing over lakes, in case everything else didn't work quite enough to impact them. So we have all of these factors, and the Endangered Species Act rigidly says we're going to protect those and keep them from going extinct and try to recover them. And it's that next point of recovery that is what's coming out now with something called the biological opinion on operations of the existing state and federal projects. 
when the federal and state projects hit a 50 year anniversary and had to relicense to provide, continue to provide water to all of the farmers, the urban districts, and everybody was contracted now to receive that water, even though the contracts may have been make up water, but to receive that, they got hit with a biological opinion that requires, among many other things, much more fish screening up and down the entire Central Valley, particularly to the north, and restrictions on the operations of the pumps in terms of how they impacted endangered species. They also require that you go a next step towards recovery. So the Bureau of Reclamation is currently studying how they are going to restore salmon above Folsom and above Shasta. And they have to come up with a report by 2020 that tells us how they're going to do that. I may not be much of a fisheries expert, had a little experience with it, but I'm not an expert. But I do know that we can pretty easily get fish somehow above a dam if we're willing to spend the money. The problem is not getting fish above a dam, it's getting the fry and the smolts both back down. If anybody has any questions, look at the Columbia, where they're trying everything that you can think of to try to make that work. But nonetheless, we are studying above Folsom and above Shasta, and probably we'll have to look at above Millerton as well. But nonetheless, dams above dams are, relatively speaking, less impactful unless that restoration program is ever sold. Just want you to keep it out there in your mind because that will come up at some point when we're talking about temperance and it will come up when we're talking about any revival of water storage above Folsom of the American. You've heard reference to the fact that there have been no significant reservoirs built in California since 1970. It is not coincidental that that date and the development of environmental laws overlap. It is also not coincidental that every project that has succeeded has had a local sponsor since then. Contra Costa, irrigation, Contra Costa Water District basically did the expansions and put in Los Vaqueros. The major other reservoirs are all down to the south, put in by Met to be able to hold when they can get it. Their Colorado River water or the state water delivered to the system that they can hold after it gets to them, when they have the opportunity in good years to get it. And the state is now heavily going into water banking with storing water in the ground to be tapped by pumping and moved later when needed. Because we've heard that when you don't have that mix of surface water, groundwater depletes, and we need to reinvigorate it, and the trade-off and the cost, and all the consequences. Back when I was the director in early 90s, we did an analysis that showed the average use of water in California was about 4.5 million acre feet over and above what we were getting annually. So we have a natural groundwater problem that's going to keep coming back to us. And we're now seeing that because the environmental laws have minimized our delivery of surface. Therefore, groundwater is now being used because the environmental laws won't let the surface water be used. So essentially, we have a massively complex system overlaid by multiple laws, which make it unlikely that you're going to see significant state or federal projects ever delivered in the future. Almost any project to succeed has to be local and locally based with local sponsors. In addition, you've got these overlaying layers and little things called CEQA and NEPA where you have to lay out all the issues that come with them and explain them and go through them with multiple points and chances of challenge. Even Governor Moonbeam, as we used to call him, has now endorsed a need to change CEQA. And I haven't even gotten into the myriad of other things like when I was discussing 1600 issues that are coming out of my old agency that are complicating things. But what we basically have is a situation today where everyone 
whether they are a relatively new water rights holder or an old water rights holder, is impacted by the current state water policies as it relates to the Delta. We have restoration and water um, supply stability as automatic factors. And just in case that wasn't enough, we laid one more state requirement on them, and that is the issue of flows. The Water Board is now obligated to establish minimum flows for the Delta outflow for the benefit of the public trust and fisheries. Where does that water come from to meet that at varying times of the year? Remember, we're already regulating for salinity, but that's not sufficient for the long other purposes of that flow. The Water Board, which must set those flows, has started that process on the San Joaquin and its tributaries. And all of a sudden, everyone who has water rights on the tributaries to the San Joaquin is saying, wait a minute, you mean I've got to pay this price and contribute? And the answer is yes, because it's not just in the Delta, it's the tributaries getting there that have to have the flows to cumulatively make it. And they're about ready to shift their focus to the Sacramento Valley as well, where the same rules are going to apply towards reading that, reaching a Delta outflow standard. So a Delta outflow standard is going to reverberate back on all existing water right holders. And remember I mentioned the Racinelli decision where it said everyone has to pay the price? And then we talked about the Delta visioning process and the BDCP, which I'll cover one more item on that in a minute, all came in. They got overlaid with the beneficial use doctrine, which was announced early as something they intend to look at. And what's, if you look at any water right in California that is subject to reopening for beneficial use and public trust. So every water right in California is subject to reopening and relooking. The BDCP, which is supposedly an answer, talks about moving water essentially around the delta again, this time under the delta with tunnels. One tunnel, two tunnels. 3,000 cubic feet per second, 9,000 cubic feet per second, 15,000 cubic feet per second, just among the range of options and volume. The concept of moving water around the delta, when I was at Fish and Game, was still something we actually endorsed. We liked the canal, because if you had it, you can pump the water out at any point you needed it to get benefit. When you put it in the tunnel, that's gone. but it's not as visible. Therefore, it may be easier to sell. But the BDCP's real purpose was not to come up with water conveyance, although that got tied to it. The BDCP was to create a way around the Endangered Species Act by creating a comprehensive planning program to interrelate habitat conservation plans and addressing Section 10 provisions of the Endangered Species Act and the Natural Community Conservation Plan at the state level to address the state level of planning at supposedly something larger than just the endangered species level. So the purpose of the BDCP is also to get long-term permits that will benefit current operations, stability, restoration, which is part of each of those permits, and to make some future uses possible. They believe that by taking and shifting that water intake point further north, they're going to get rid of some of the reverse flows in the delta and make things better. But even with the northern intakes, they still operate the pumps in the lower delta, and there's still going to be some impacts there. So that's the theory behind a lot of what we've been doing. Funding I haven't even touched on. That's going to be heard later. But that's an even bigger question, and how that place plays out. So I just want to leave you with one thought, and I credit Congressman McClintock for this thought. We are still fighting the war of a limited pie, with no new storage, no new water. We're only going to have a chance to address these bigger problems if we increase the pie. Additional storage is the key to that. Thank you.